bringing hope to you and me. I plead the blood. I plead the blood over all the power of hell. Satan, you cannot prevail. I plead the blood. For our lost and dying loved ones, the blood still saves today. When we cry for healing, the blood is ours to claim. The blood is still the answer for every battle of the mind. There is no greater power. Demons tremble when we cry. I plead the blood. I plead the blood that was shed on Calvary. Bringing hope to you and me, I plead the blood. I plead the blood over all the power of hell. Satan, you cannot prevail. I plead the blood. For our lost and dying loved ones, his blood still saves today. When we cry for healing, the blood is ours to claim. The blood is still the answer for every battle of the mind. There is no greater power. Demons tremble when we the blood, I plead the blood that was shed on Calvary, bringing hope to you and me. I plead the blood, I plead the blood over all the power of hell. Satan, you cannot Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. I may be ready for the Word of God tonight. Amen. For those that may be watching online, couldn't make it to church tonight, God bless all of you. Uh, some of you, hey, what do y'all think of my put together pulpit? I hope not. I was thinking about it the other day. I'm not making no excuses, but I'm thinking maybe it's just old plastic, you know. Maybe it's an old, maybe it's old acrylic. Because I, I watched the clip, and I just, I did this here. And, I mean, parts on it broke that, like, this whole thing in the back broke. I mean, I didn't hit that. I'm thinking this whole thing, it fell all apart. But, uh, but they make a special glue It's a plastic weld glue that actually melts the plastic into the plastic. So, I think we might be all right as long as I just, you know, keep my hands to myself. So <laughs> praise the Lord. Uh, but it was interesting, wasn't it? Uh, thank the Lord that my tablet was all right. It could have been worse. Uh, but we're going to, I want to talk to you, just uh, just have a heart-to-heart -heart with you tonight. Uh, this is something that I feel like is uh, expedient for a lot of people if you've been serving the Lord for quite a long time. And by that, I mean people that have been serving the Lord for several years and people also that have been in ministry or are in ministry. If you're listening online or you're here and you're in ministry or you're thinking about getting in ministry or you've been serving the Lord for quite a while, I want you to really 
give me a little time to dissect some of this because I feel like that it may just speak to you. I'd like to talk to you like I was having a heart-to-heart one-on-one with you because I really, really believe it's a situation or a subject that needs to be addressed, especially from the pulpit. If you have your Bible tonight, we're going to turn to the book of Revelation. We're going all the way to the back of the Bible. And we're going to turn to Revelation chapter number 2. And it's good to have my Aunt Norma. I try not to ever I try not to ever embarrass anybody. I love her to pieces. Always glad when she can uh, be with us. And any of my family, I just love my family very much. We were, we were brought up to love family. And, and, um, and some folks are easy to love and some ain't so easy to love. And my Aunt Norma's always been easy to love. Praise the Lord for that, right? Amen. So, plus on top of that, her daughters should have been my sister, Amanda. We're like two peas in a, in a pod. Revelation chapter number 2 and verse number 1. And if you have it, say amen tonight. Revelation 2 and chapter number, chapter number 2, verse number 1. And I want to read through to verse number 7. These are uh, very, very common passages for anyone that has ever uh, been serving the Lord for any length of time at all. But he says here, dealing with the church at Ephesus, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. How many of you know who the angel is? When the Bible refers to the angel, he's dealing with the pastor, the pastor of the church. Somebody say pastor. That's who he's dealing with. These seven uh, angels, these are, these are the men of God, the pastors, overseers over the flock of God in these seven places. But he said, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience how thou canst not bear them which are evil, how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and has patience for my name's sake and has labored and has not fainted. Very important that you understand that Ephesus was such a church that the Lord could say, you've been working for me And you have not fainted. In other words, you're still in the fight. But listen to what he said. Verse number four. He says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Thou hast left thy first love. You've heard preachers possibly, people say that you've lost your love. You lost your first love. That's not what the Bible said. Say amen, somebody. It said, Thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and what did he say to do? He said, Repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. You know what that tells me? That tells me that repentance is, is the needful element to achieve what is pleasing in the eyes of the Lord for the church at Ephesus. Verse number 6, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This is what I want to have a heart to heart with you on tonight. You're listening, you're a preacher, a minister. I, I want to talk to you as well. But I want to preach on this or talk on this subject tonight. Faded first love. Faded first love. Will you raise your hand and heart to the Lord and let's ask the Lord to just have his will and way in this service. Lord, we're thankful for the privilege and the opportunity to declare the very precepts of the Word of God. It is a privilege for me to be a minister and an ambassador for the kingdom of God. I'm asking you for the next few moments that regardless of the size of this congregation, 
regardless of what obstacles may be before us or behind us, regardless of whatever spiritual attacks of the enemy, regardless of everything the enemy would do to destroy and devour, I'm asking you to give us the strength and the clarity of mind and heart and speech to not only speak the truth but to receive the truth in Jesus' name. And everyone can say amen tonight. Amen. But I want to talk to us on the subject of faded first love. Faded first love. I have found myself personally that in many dimensions of our lives that whether it's a job or a relationship or ministry appointments or marriage, etc., etc., in all of these different things and elements of life that there is a tendency for us to lose the excitement and the passion that we started out with. Uh, if you look around at uh, people that get involved in marriage, one of the things that always breaks my heart, and I guess this may be because it's coming from a heart and mind that sees things differently than somebody that may be going through the moment, but my wife and I, we've been together since she was 13 and I was 15 years old, and so I, I can't quite, I, I've counseled with people, I've been right beside, I've been through stuff with people, but I can't honestly say that I've been through divorce, so I can't, I can't really side and relate as much as I wish that I could with people. But when I see people go through marriage troubles and you see them so easily uh, throw in the towel, as we say, and just quit, so easily, the first little storm that comes along or the bills aren't, or aren't so great or maybe the kids are giving them a fit or something's going on and they just so easily are ready to quit. And then you watch them give up and then they move on. I always have the hardest time understanding that because that is not, that, that's not what the way that I operate. I just don't see things that way. I believe that there are times that maybe things don't work out and, and people do. They do in life. They move on. And I understand that. But, but I believe there should be this tenacity and there should be this resilience against obstacles and, and confrontation and trouble in life that, that you don't just give up so easy. And if I'm right, say amen. When you become a child of God, even the more so as a Christian, we ought to do our best to have a resilience against the a tendency to lose that passion. But what a lot of times I see people, they, they do, they start out excited. And this is the part that I think that bothers me the most. I even shared this with my wife recently. I said, you know, looking back, I said, I almost, uh, it almost makes me reluctant to want to marry somebody, uh, marry two people to each other because uh, I've had a few people that I've married through the years and I watched them. I saw them when they were, when I sat down with them and I talked about them being, being married and we went through all the different aspects of marriage and I counseled them and I talked about the goods and the bads and, and about making sure that you're in it for the long haul before you commit. And they were excited. They loved each other. You could see the love in their face. You could see the anticipation. You could see the way they looked at each other. You know, by all accounts, it looked to me like they, they were absolutely madly in love with each other. But then you give it some months and years and time goes on, and then the next thing you know, they're blocking each other on their Facebook account, and they're not answering each other's phone, and they're talking bad-mouthing each other to this one and that one and the other. And, and I just, how do you make that gigantic leap from way over there to way over here? How did you get to that point? I mean, that same, that same person that one day you used to run your hands through their, their hair and you looked at them and your heart just melted when you looked at them and you thought about being with them the rest of your life. How do you make that gigantic leap from there to way over there? Now, I know that there are problems that come into marriage, but the one that I want to deal with for just a moment for you to understand the direction that the Lord had put me in it, the, the element of a relationship that begins to fade and it's not as fervent and the passion's not there like it one time was. You understand what I'm saying? You, you look at it in the beginning stages, but in, every, in many aspects of life, there's this tendency to lose something along the way. 
And you see somebody, they go through uh, the process of marriage and, and no longer are they excited about that person coming home from work. You, they're not excited about taking a picture with them. They're not excited about going on a date with them. But there was a time that they were. And so what is it that happened? What is it that transpired? What did they lose in that relationship that caused them to find themselves in a place that they no longer want to be with that person? Their love is not the same as it used to be. Now, you've heard me testify probably if you've been under uh, my pastorship or preaching for any length of time. You may have heard me tell this. It's an embarrassing story, but it does bear a relevance to what we're preaching about tonight. But whenever I wasn't even saved, right, right before the Lord had really came in and done a work in my life, my wife had been praying for me, and uh, you've heard me tell the story of how that one night while we were laying in the bed getting ready to go to sleep that I looked at her and I said, you know, I, I don't know how to tell you this. I said, but I'm not in love with you anymore. We had been married for a few years. We had at least one child, maybe another on the way. I don't recall uh, the, ch the child situation there, but I know we had at least one child together. We've been together for many years at that point because we had dated four years before we ever got married. And so... <laughs> I looked at the woman who committed herself to be with me till death do us part. And I said, I'm not in love with you anymore. I want you to know that is a devastating blow. It doesn't matter on what end you're on for somebody to feel that. And it was, it was tough for me because I literally did feel that way. I thank God that the Lord allowed me. And this is proof. If you're in a situation going through the same thing or you've got a family member going through similar and they say, I fell out of love, I'm proof that you can fall back in love again. So thank the Lord for that. Can you say, I thank the Lord for that. Uh, but, but I had told her, I just don't love you the way that I used to. And I said, you know, uh, to be honest with you, I said, if something were to happen to you, it'd break my heart. I said, if I found out that you got hurt, I would be upset. I said, but... Uh, I love you, I guess the best way I could put it, and this is what I told her, I said, I love you maybe like the love you have for your brother or for your sister. I said, just not in love with you anymore. And uh, I remember that night, you know, I rolled over in the bed to go to sleep, and I could feel the bed shaking as she was crying and upset that night, and rightfully so. And that is a devastating thing within a relationship because something has fell apart, and somewhere along the line, something went wrong. And that is a heartbreaking thing. Can somebody say amen? That two people that used to love each other so much. Have you got anybody that you, you got any children or someone that are close to you? And uh, what people don't understand is that whenever two people fall apart, they don't just go fall apart themselves, but everybody that is interconnected with them, with them goes through the same process as well. Uh, you know, it may be like with me, with my daughter and her separation with her husband. And for me, it was difficult because this was my son-in-law. This was someone that, that I had called son. This was someone that I had got Christmas gifts for and that I tried to mentor as a father. And I did the best that I could. This was someone that I cared about. And so when she went through the divorce, not only did she go through it, but we went through it as well. And so it breaks a lot of hearts. And there's a lot of unnecessary things a lot of times that if we could just look back in retrospect, that we could change a lot. And while I'm on the subject tonight, I don't know why I feel like saying this. Maybe it applies to at least somebody. But it breaks my heart when you see people that fall apart like this. And it really doesn't make a lot of sense because when they fall apart, a lot of times, you know, they, they've, not, they've stopped doing something with their self. They don't, they don't comb the hair like they used to. They don't brush the teeth anymore. They don't try to do anything with themselves. And now the relationship falls apart. And sometimes there are certain elements of that relationship that contribute to it. And you're going to know what I'm talking about when I say this. But has it ever ceased to amaze you as well that when people fall apart, that when they start looking for another relationship, that all the things that they could have done to fix the last relationship, now all of a sudden they're going to change. Am I right, anybody? Now all of a sudden they're going to change. Now, this ain't a relationship message, but I wanted to go ahead and interject this while I'm here. The Lord will bring it all together. But you see, 
that woman that maybe she's just let herself go. She, maybe she's put on a lot of weight or whatever. All of a sudden, now that she's out of that relationship, now she's going to go start doing her makeup, and she's going to start fixing her hair, go get a perm, and, and uh, she's going to lose a little weight, and, and he's going to go to the gym and start doing something with us, start putting some cologne on, actually start taking a shower. And You understand what I'm saying? Doing something with his old stanky self. Because now he is in a position where he's on the prowl again. And this is what I don't understand, especially when it comes to a religious, the religious or the spiritual aspect, I guess I should say. Then people start talking about, well, I'm going to get back in church, and I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to serve the Lord. Well, you could have done that with the last relationship, and there's a lot of things you could have done before that might have salvaged all of that so that you don't have to go through what you're going through now. You see, the same thing is replicated in ministry. I've met preachers before that they just, they, they're so adamant that they are going to have to make a move. They need to go somewhere else where the grass is greener. They need to go somewhere else and pastor somewhere else or evangelize or go to a different mission field. And sometimes it is needful under the discretion of the Lord's direction. God may lead them in a different place. But when people are looking for grass to be greener somewhere else, I've watched ministers do this very thing. And they go somewhere else and now they're going to interject a vision and they're going to interject excitement and they're going to start doing all these different things. And the reality is, if you work what you already have, you've heard the saying before that the grass is greener on the other side. But it would be just as green where you're at if you fertilize it, if you work with it, if you water it, if you do something with it. You can't expect everything. And then the problem is a lot of times is that people are looking at someone else's relationship, someone else's ministry, and they expect to have the exact same thing as somebody else. But you may not understand that they're up at 5 o'clock in the morning, every morning going out into the garden and taking a water hose and watering those plants. They're doing something to make sure they can maintain what they have. While you lay in the bed till 10 o'clock in the day, get up, you never water the plants, you never, but you expect to have what somebody else has. That's good preaching whether you said amen or not. The truth is if you work with it and you fertilize it, God can do something with it. And it's the same with so many aspects of life. But a lot of times things fall apart. Have you ever been on a job before? And when you first started working there, you were so excited. Anybody? Anybody know what I'm saying? You, you were so tickled to death that you got that job. You were so beside yourself, so thankful to be making $10.50 an hour. But you give it a few months. You give it a year or two. And the next thing you know, you're the most disgruntled employee that anybody's ever saw. How did we make the gigantic leap? I'm going to preach to you tonight whether you realize it. How do you make that gigantic leap from way over here to way over here? You were so excited. You were thankful when the boss asked you to do anything. You were yes sir, no sir, whatever sir. I mean you were respectful but now all of a sudden you make the gigantic leap. Everything they ask you. Nope, I'm not doing that. Nope, I'm not working no overtime. Nope, I'm not doing this and nope, I'm not doing that and all this sort of stuff. You have become disgruntled and you have in your compassion, in your passion, in your fervency, and in your excitement, you have lost something along the way. Something's happened to you. Something has happened to you. You know, I began to think on the way to church, and I felt like the Holy Ghost showed me something that I wanted to that I want to bring out, draw your attention to. If you've ever worked somewhere that you were glad to be there. But then time went by and you hated to even hear the sound of the alarm clock because you hated your job. You ever been there? There are times that the reason that you have lost your anticipation and excitement and passion for a thing is because of people. Somebody say other people. Say that, other people. Have you ever worked somewhere before and it wasn't necessarily you? You liked the line of work you were doing? You liked the type of work you were doing? It was something you dreamed about maybe for years? But then you got on the job and other people made the job miserable. Have you ever been there before? I want to talk to you for just a minute. Because other people can sometimes be 
part of the reason that you make the great leap from excitement all the way over to here where you can't wait to find another job. You can't stand being there. You hate being there because of other people. But let me forewarn you tonight that the Lord has already shown us in the word that there would be people that are going to come. There are going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. There are going to be people in the spiritual aspect of things that are going to do everything they can. And then sometimes they don't even realize they are being used by the devil to bring torment and disaster into your marriage, your ministry, your career, or whatever aspect that you're disgruntled in. I've watched it before. They don't even realize they're being used like a tool in the enemy's hands to cause you to not even want to do what you're doing. Whether you're a preacher and you got some church member who's making it so difficult you're ready to quit, whether or not it's somebody that's in a, in a marriage and it's somebody that won't leave your husband alone and you're just about ready to resign the marriage because you're tired of somebody always trying to push their way in and take your man away from you. You understand what I'm saying? There's always this other aspect of other people. There are some of you that would tell me tonight if it was just me and Jesus, everything would be all right. But I've got to deal with hard-headed, stubborn, aggravating other people who have made it miserable for me to, to live and to succeed and to have anything. The problem is that I see within the church is that sometimes when it comes to, and I'm just going to talk about the congregation side of things, there are other people that you go to church with that when you first went to that church, you wanted to be there. You wanted to sing in that choir till you got in that, that choir and you had to sing beside somebody that's never on key, somebody beating a tambourine in your left eardrum about to blow your ear or that nobody was in tune on the platform or somebody was in the wrong key or it wasn't your style of worship or somebody decided they didn't want to have choir practice. Or, I mean, I'm telling you, I've been pastor long enough. I've done seen and heard about everything. People never cease to amaze me when it comes to problems and troubles and things people don't like. But you got somebody else that caused you to quit going to the choir. Somebody else caused you to lose your excitement. You used to be looking forward to go to church, but now you can't stand to go to church. What has happened to you? You've let somebody else steal your thunder. You've let somebody else steal your zeal. Honey, let me tell you, when it comes to the will of God, if you know you're in the will of God, you get up, you put your church going clothes on, whatever you're going to wear. I mean, if you just come in from work, come on in in your work clothes. It don't matter. Get yourself together. Get to the house of God. And when you get there, if other people is your problem, if it's somebody else who's always got something silly to say, I'm just going to step all the, over the bow of the ship tonight and say stupid. If somebody else got something stupid to say and they walk up to you and say the most outlandish dumb thing you've ever heard and blows you out of the water go to church quit worrying about what she said he said they said go to church stand there and when it's time to worship put your blinders on put you a set of earplugs figuratively speaking it and hear the word of God and get what you need from the Lord because if God put you in that place he put you there knowing that there would be other people he put you there knowing there are going to be distractions through other people. There are going to be people that are going to try you and cause you to want to quit. How far have you gone, preacher? How far have you gone, church member, that you're going to let somebody stop you from doing what God has commissioned you to do? You have no zeal, no ambition, no love. You're train wrecked. And you don't want to go on because you're tired of dealing with people. Let me tell you, if you if you can't handle people being a sore uh, in a sore in your side or a thorn in your flesh, if you can't deal with aggravating people, the last thing you need to do is get into ministry. Please spare somebody, spare the flock of God. If you cannot deal with people, stay at home. Get a box of rich crackers and some sausage and cheese and eat it and watch an old movie or something. But don't 
Don't sign up and get into ministry if you know already that you're going to face people and the soonest people come along that you're going to quit at the first sign of adversity. Get back in the choir. Get back in that position. Get back in the ministry. Get back on your knees. Get back in prayer. Get back in the anointing. Get back on that instrument and get back in the will of God. Somebody say amen. Somebody say, help Brother Myers tonight. Years ago, I had a, preach, a, a preacher that I knew that conveyed the sentiments to me that it is not going to be easy. And I knew what he was saying was true. But it was only until that I actually went through it myself that I was able to realize the volume of what he was saying. You see, when you talk about marriage, You've never been married. You may think that you know what it's going to be like. I sat down with my uh, former son-in-law when he wanted to marry my daughter. And I said, son, there are going to be problems in your marriage. I said, it's not a matter of if. It is a matter of when. You're going to have days that you're going to think, man, I made a big mistake. I said, because life throws a lot of stuff at you and your wife. I said, you've got to be prepared and know what you're getting into. This is what the young man said to me. I have been raised in a family with a mother and a father who've had a lot of marriage issues and this and that. And so I feel like I've got a handle on it. Just because you watched it from the ring doesn't know what you doesn't mean you know what it feels like to get punched by Mike Tyson. Come on now. You might have sat in the stands, but you don't know what it feels like to be DDT'd by some wrestling professional. You don't know what that feels like when you can feel every bone in your body breaking and cracking. And the same way spiritually, you may think you know what you're getting yourself into, but whenever you are you're in the arena and you're going through it, it has a way of bringing reality to the forefront. Years ago, I was on a job and uh, anybody that knows me, you know that I love craftsmanship type things. I love to build. I love to work on stuff. I love to take my, you can ask my mom as a kid. My mom came in. I thought she was going to have cardiac arrest. I wonder my my mom is still alive to this day, all that I put her through. But she came in one day and she had a new TV. You remember the ones that had a screen and it looked like it was in a cabinet? Some of them had a record player and all kind of other stuff in the top of it. Boy, that's going back way back, ain't it? This one didn't have a record player, but it was a cabinet style. Real nice. Had, I don't know if it was slightly used, but I think it was brand new. I had to hold back of the TV off. Taken apart when my mom came home. What are you doing, son? I said, I want to see how it works. But all of my life I've had, I've been intrigued by how things work, putting things together. And it has helped me through life to be able to know how to fix things and build things. I love working with wood. I love it. If you look around the church, you'll notice several different things in this church. This whole entire platform, me and my, my boys, when they were, we first came here, we remodeled and, re, and built this entire platform up here, the knee walls, everything, uh, just as the vision God gave. That sound booth in the back, built that. Many different things throughout the church, built. And I love to work with wood. But I'm on a job one day. And I'm watching this guy. He is a carpenter by trade. He is an expert. I mean a professional. I'm probably what you might call a hobbyist. But I love it either way. And I'm watching this man as he's working. And I'm admiring his work. How skilled that he was, Brother Eric. He was so good. I mean, his corners were so perfectly mitered. And he was working with crown molding. He was building cabinets. And I was so impressed. So I spoke up one day. He was an older man. He was way up in his age. You could tell he'd been doing it for years. When you get around craftsmen, you can tell a lot of times by looking at their fingers. 
may sound crazy, but you worked in construction, a lot of times it has a way of affecting and forming your fingers in a certain way you can tell. Uh, even back in the day with people that swing a hammer, they call it hammer hand. Just where you've held a hammer in your hand so long that your hand begins to change shape with your hand. But I could tell this man had been doing it for years and I approached him and I, with a smile on my face, I said, I love your work. He said, well, thank you. I said, you know, I said, I absolutely love working and building with wood. He paused and he looked at me. And he made a statement that stuck with me for many years. He said, be glad that you never did it as a profession if you really enjoy it as a hobby. I said, why is that? He said, because it would have most likely destroyed the fun and the thrill. He said, I've been doing this almost all my life as a career. He said, when you do it as a career, he said, I got into it. I loved it when I got into it. He said, but I hate it now. Something he's good at. Can I preach to somebody? I see people that are good at the drums. I see they're good at the piano. They're good at preaching. They're good at teaching Sunday school. They're good with youth. But they've grown cold and they almost despise doing it anymore because something's happened along the way. Somebody say the process. Say the process. Something has happened in the process that has caused you to lose your excitement and your thrill and the gumption to get up and keep doing it. I want to tell you, if you ever get into ministry, I can speak from a ministerial position. If you ever have a challenge, your greatest challenge sometimes is not the congregation that you preach to. Sometimes your greatest congregation will be the man or the woman looking at you when you stand in front of the mirror. Keeping yourself motivated. Keeping yourself on fire. Keeping yourself prayed up. Keeping yourself motivated to get up and do it one more time. Can somebody say, Lord, help us all? Because the process can be brutal. There is something in the medical field they call compassion fatigue. It is a sad, very sad element to a person's career compassion fatigue you see these medical professionals that deal with people that come in with major injuries sometimes their leg may be nearly lacerated off there are times they have to go to a family and say I'm sorry but your son passed away on the surgery table there are times that they have to go to that waiting room and say he didn't make it through surgery they begin to deal with that compassion fatigue and what happens to them is that they've done so much for so long and they've seen so much hurt and so much pain and so much destruction that it begins to rob them of the emotion of love and compassion. And they no longer feel bad for anybody that's hurting. Some of them are some of them are like that because of what other people have done to them. Can I tell you, I told you other people can be a problem sometimes in ministry. I've had some along the way in pastoring. You know, the Bible said to give heed to them that watch for your soul that you may, they may be able to do it with joy and not with grief and that sort of thing. It's in the book of Hebrews. I believe the latter book to part of a chapter there. But I have pastored people that made pastoring miserable. I'm not, I'm not joking. I, it's sad. I have pastored people that made pastoring miserable. They made me not want to pastor. They made me wish I'd have never said yes. They were miserable people who make other people miserable. And if you're not careful, you let those people dictate to you your calling. God called you in spite of them. God called you knowing that they were coming. He said, go on anyway. That wise preacher, the apostle Paul, told the young Timothy, he said, beware. Grievous wolves are going to come in. They're not going to spare the flock. 
You know what he was doing? He was giving him the 411. Son, things are not going to be easy. You better make sure you got thick skin. You better square your shoulders back and be ready. It's going to be a bumpy ride. But at the end of the race, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. At the end of the race, there's going to be a prize. There's going to be a crown awaiting those who have been faithful to the end. We're going to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to enjoy the benefits and the blessing. He said, lay up your treasure where moth and rust does not corrupt. Let me tell you, if you try to build a kingdom down here, you'll be a sad man when you die. But if you build on that sand in heaven... If you build on the crystal clear streets of gold of heaven, if you build upon things in heaven, you won't be disappointed when you get there. Can you say amen, somebody? Oh, I'm telling you tonight, it's a sad, sad thing. But this carpenter told me, son, if you enjoy doing it, be glad you never took it on as a career. It's because something is lost in the, in the process. In the process, you lose the thrill. Can I tell you something here tonight that is not very spiritual? It's not very popular, but I don't try to, to out-spiritual nobody. I don't try to be the most popular preacher. I'm just here, here to tell you the truth. There have been times that Brother Souffron, that I was burned out. This is where a lot of people hit the ministry brick wall of burnout. You do, and you do, and you give, and you give, and you give, and you give some more to people that could care less. You fight for people who don't fight for their self. You stand up for people who wouldn't stand up for you or spit on you if you were on fire. And after a while, you begin to get burned out. Do you know, I watch some of the most faithful saints of God do the very same thing. It is imperative that you hear this message tonight if you've been serving the Lord for any length of time because you are not, uh, you're not a non-vulnerable, can I put it that way? You're not exempt, if I can say it like that. You're not exempt tonight. If you've been serving the Lord for a while, I want you to know there is or could come a time where that you go through a place of your life that you face a certain level of burnout, that you get tired of going to church, hearing three songs, two specials, an offering taken up, 45 minutes to an altar, an hour of preaching, three minutes in an altar service and go home and let's come back next service and do it again and not really seeing the results, seeing the church struggle because people don't give like they used to, seeing the church struggle because people don't show up like they one time did, watching the church struggle and can't do mission work and ministry and outreach because they don't have the finances because people are not there to contribute. Let me tell you, you might go through those places and you might go through disdain because you show up and somebody else didn't come let me tell you it affects the morale of the whole church what if everybody made the same decision I had somebody tell me here a while back they said I asked somebody a family that was coming regularly they said how come y'all don't come on the midweek service anymore. So, well, I got tired of coming and not seeing anybody coming. So let's take a whole other family out of the equation because what that tells me is the morale affected them. And if they quit, they're going to affect the morale of somebody else. You may not understand this, but people say it all the time. They say, well, you know, we're going to throw him a, or her a pastor appreciation. I have preached other pastors pastor appreciation before. And when I do, I go out of my way to do everything I can to get it across to that church. It's great to honor a man or woman of God one day out of the year. But the greatest pastor appreciation you can give any pastor is just show up. Just be a part of what's going on because the morale, if you think 
you get affected when people don't get in. If you think you get affected when people don't support the fundraiser. When you stayed up all night baking cookies uh, and nobody hardly wanted to buy them. Or you set up for a party and hardly nobody showed up. How do you think the people in ministry feel? My Lord, help us tonight. I'm trying to help somebody. It is the process that most of the faithful saints that I have seen get fatigued and they fade in their fervency. I've watched people that at one time they used to really get in. When the preacher's preaching, come on, that's right. There were times they'd jump up on their feet, that's right, come on and preach it. Now you can't even hardly get them to come to church. People that used to get up and sing in the choir. I never shall forget the day. Man, they'll about knock everybody over. If we were bowling pins, everybody, it'd be a straight a wipeout. Come on now. I never shall. Now they get up in the choir and they sing like an ironing board. I never shall forget the day. All the burdens of my... And I'm not preaching to any of our people here. I'm talking about in general. Look across the church of America and you see a lot of people that have got no enthusiasm. They don't even want to be there. I had somebody, you know some of you know this, but I don't broadcast our music like I used to. Some of it's because we've been doing everything we can with what we've got. And some people are hateful and harsh. I had somebody send me a message one time. Said, Pastor, I don't know if you realize this, but you've got a couple of people on your platform. You might want to tell them to smile because the world is watching them through a camera lens uh, and they look like they don't want to be there. I thought, my God, if I could and just help people understand your love is fading and it isn't what it used to be. Preachers that get up in the pulpit that look like they'd rather not be there. Singers who grab a hold of the microphone. Well, I, I guess I'm, a, I'm not much of a singer but I'm going to sing my old song tonight. Uh, and they look like they should just go ahead and lay the mic down and have a seat somewhere or go find a place to pray because they're, come on now. Somebody's going to think I'm trying to be mean. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just telling you that something's wrong. Somebody say something's wrong. The anticipation's not there. Something has been lost. You're like that guy that got the job, man. You were so excited you came home and told your wife, I got a job, I got a J-O-B. Woo, I finally got one for me. And the next thing you know, you're coming home, you kick the cat, slam the door, fuss your wife, and you're mad because dinner ain't ready and everything's wrong. What's wrong with you? What happened to you? Let me tell you, it shouldn't be that way. Say amen, somebody. The reason I'm telling you is that we're letting the cares of this world and we're letting other people stop us from having the joy of the Lord. I said it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. The old saints used to say, it's a bubbling, it's a bubbling, it's a bubbling in my soul. Can I tell you tonight, it's a sad indictment when we look like somebody stole the pick of the litter from us. Old dog had a litter of puppies and somebody came by the house and stole my, stole the pick of the litter from me. I had a Snickers bar. I didn't have but one more bite and somebody took it from me. Huh? Sad. No joy. You want to win the world? You got to start with you. If the world don't see joy, if the world don't see a song, if the world don't see a reason to have what you got, then they're not going to want what you got. Who look like they're excited. You realize tonight, I got to get into this because there's so much meat here. But do you realize you could be very good at what you do? But you don't come across very good at what you do. You can be the best guitar player in the entire state of Florida. 
But your attitude can ruin it all. Come on now. You might be the best pastor's wife anybody's ever saw. But you let a handful of people get on your nerves. And your attitude lately stinks. Come on now pastor. Help us all. Something's happened in the process. Something during the process has changed you. So, Pastor, you use the text of the church at Ephesus. What about Ephesus? Let me talk to you about Ephesus for a minute. I want you to see some of the important things about Ephesus. If we were to testify, if Ephesus was alive and well today, that church of then was alive and well today, the testimony of Ephesus would have sounded something like this. It's an active church. You look at what the Lord said. It was an active church. They were busy. They were busy doing the Lord's work. They were not just that, but they were a faithful church. They were continuing on. They had patience. He mentioned it in two different occasions. Thou hast born and you've had patience. You've dealt with a lot of stuff and you're still in the fight. Not just that, but they were an organized church. They weren't a ragtag bunch of people who didn't have their act together. They were an organized, recognized church that was recognized by God himself. Not just that, but they were a compassionate church. He said, you've had compassion. You've, you've had patience. You've borne and dealt with people. You've dealt with stuff. You've shown charity. You've shown love. I'm thankful for that. Not only that, but they were an evangelizing church. They were a church that was actively trying to reach the lost with the gospel message. Not just that, but they were a church who stood by their convictions. Let me tell you that just because your pastor preaches gun barrel straight and shoots with both, both barrels every service, that don't mean that you have not had or have a faded love experience. Doesn't mean that you've left your first doesn't mean that you haven't left your first love. This was a church, the Bible said in verse number six, but this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And then he also told us in the word of God, he says there. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Thou hast left thy first love. But this is what he says in verse number two and three. Listen, I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil. In other words, you don't put up with junk. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and not. When somebody rose up and said, I'm a man of God, they tried them and proved whether they were or not. They had convictions and they stood by their convictions. Yet the Lord said, nevertheless. Somebody say, nevertheless. You know what's interesting about the way the Lord goes about this? It's very interesting. You read it yourself, you'll see it. The Lord, He commends them, celebrates them. Then He drops the bomb of nevertheless. And then before He's done, He commends them again. I thought this is very interesting because the Lord's way of handling these people is a lot like a father handles his children. Listen, sit down, son. I just want you to know, I've been noticing you've been doing real good in school and, and I appreciate the fact that you did the dishes the other night. I saw you took out the trash last Tuesday. But listen, i got a couple things I need to talk to you about. That's the way the Lord handled it. He didn't come with a belt. He didn't come with a bat right away. But he commended them and said, I see some things you're doing right. But there's something wrong. And let me tell you, church, a lot of times we preach about Laodicea and we talk about the lukewarm church. Am I right? You hear in the Pentecostal church a lot of preaching on the lukewarm church. But I would venture to tell you that there's a lot of people that are just as guilty as Ephesus. They're still evangelizing, but they don't have the same love that they did when they started.
They're still pastors' wives, but they don't have the same love that they had when they started. They're still preachers and pastors, but they don't have the same fervency and love and desire and, and all of that. That The thrill is gone. They've left the first love. What I'm telling you is, is like the song that you hear that they sing sometimes. says, I, I don't want to go through the motions. There's a lot of people that are coming to church. They're going through the motions. They're showing up. They're pulling up in the parking lot, taking the keys out, throwing them in the purse, coming in, sitting in the church and going through the motions. But the love that they one time had is not there. The problem with that is, is typically people like that, after a while, either one or two things, they'll, become, they'll fall into a, a place of habit and they only do what they do by habit or, or because they're in a position and they have no choice or you'll watch them as they slowly fade right on out of the church, little bit by little bit by little bit. How do you know, Pastor? I've, I've seen it, and it's heartbreaking to watch somebody who loved the, loved the Lord. I've watched them. They've shouted and danced under the power of the Holy Ghost, and they're not even in church today. Am I right? I've watched people who have talent and gift to play instruments for the Lord, and I've watched them bless congregations, and I've watched people when they sang, I've watched these folks, they just go to the altar and cry and talk to the Lord and get things right. But some of them same people are not in ministry, not in church anymore. They've let something come in the way. You know, this is what I want to ask you. When the night is long, and when the monotony of doing the same thing week after week after week after week, day after day after day of serving the Lord, same thing today as it was last month, same thing today as it was two years ago, when the monotony comes along, will you let it steal the one-on-one -on -one passion that you had with the Lord when you first gave your life to Him? Are you in love with the Lord tonight? Are you crazy in love with him like you once were? You know what? You may not realize this, but it shows in your worship. Now, I've met some people that could really put on a show, and it wasn't nothing to it. But, but for the most part, it shows. It shows. You want to be there or you don't. It shows. Let me close with this. We know that Ephesus might have been a, a church that the Lord could commend, and nevertheless, they had somewhat that he was against. But in closing tonight, what if, what if it were possible that the Lord could come into this church service tonight and do like some employers do? You ever heard of a 90-day evaluation? Anybody ever heard of that? Now, I've been an employee, and I've, I've been an employer, and I know how to talk from both sides of this thing because I've seen both. But in the corporate world, they have sometimes evaluations, and they're going to evaluate your job performance and such as that. If you've done real well, sometimes they'll give you a promotion. Sadly, within the church, people want promotions. They want a pastor. They want to preach. They want to evangelize. They want to sing in the choir. They want to get up and play an instrument. Or they want to teach a class. Or they want to do a certain thing. And they want a promotion. But they want to do it without any dedication or devotion. Am I right? Yeah. But what if the Lord tonight sat down one-on-one -on -one with Brother Eric Joyner. He sat down one-on-one -on -one with Clay Poole or sat down with Pastor Myers, just me and the Lord. And the Lord started going down an evaluation list. And that, that evaluation list that we would be evaluated by would be this right here, the Word of God. What if the Lord were to look at me? I want you to listen to me. I want you to really hear this because it's imperative that every one of us, you serve the Lord for a while, you need to hear this. What if the Lord went down that list of evaluation and he said to you, you know, Joe Myers, you don't worship like you, you used to. Oh, yeah, you get up and you lift your hands, but you know that feeling inside of you? It ain't the same as it used to be. What's happened to you? What if the Lord came by and he said, Preacher, 
Why do you wait till the last minute to get your message together? You don't think about it all week long. You don't get down and pray. You don't ask me to give you a message. You just grab something and run with it. Is it because you got tired of people that got in that didn't get in whether you studied or you didn't? Are you doing this for me? I wonder what the Lord would say if he was to look at where we are right now, where we were. Because... I know that as time goes on, we're going to change. Ministry, life itself has changed me just like it's changed some of you. Serving the Lord, there are things I've changed. I don't look at some things the same way when I first got into this. But I'm talking about the kind of change that there is no fire. There's no enthusiasm. There's no, there's no Holy Ghost there anymore. There's very little to no prayer life. Something has changed. Sometimes we do just enough to get by, and then we want to blame every, we complain about everything going on in our life when really the one we need to be looking at would be the man standing in the mirror. The woman standing in the mirror. Stand to your feet tonight, if you will, all across the house. I've had guys along the way that I have hired to help me to do ceiling work. Years ago, I had about eight to ten guys that were working for me. And when they first started out, I could trust them to do what I asked them to do. But over a period of time, they got around some of the other guys, and sometimes they'd cut up, and then they'd start fooling around, then they started cheating time, and then they started cutting corners, and they started changing over time. Do you know, I hate to say this, but church folk change over time. If that's you, you're in ministry, or you've been serving the Lord for a while, and you recognize the fact that you just ain't like you used to be, you might say, well, I'm just going to find me another church, and that'll fix it. If I can get a better preacher, that'll fix it. No, you're going to have to fix you with you and the Lord in the altar of prayer. I'm not telling you good preaching don't make a difference. I'm not telling you good singing don't help. But I'm telling you, if you want to get better, you're going to have to start right here with you, you and the Lord. We'll give you an opportunity tonight. Give this altar call. I'm done tonight.